Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi wraps up a six-country tour of the Middle East. We'll discuss China's economic and political role in the region. Hello, I'm Mike Walter filling in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Wang Yi's visit to the Middle East is being described as an economic and diplomatic success. Among the highlights, China agreed to invest 400 billion U.S. dollars in Iran over the next 25 years in exchange for oil to fuel China's economy. In another deal with the United Arab Emirates, China will partner with an Abu Dhabi company to produce annually up to 200 million doses of its COVID-19 vaccine, Sinopharm. It's the first production of the Chinese vaccine outside the country. Chinese Foreign Minister also visited with leaders in Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Oman, and Bahrain. For more on China's role in the Middle East, let's bring in our panel. Joining us now from Oxford in the United Kingdom is Samuel Romani. He's a doctoral candidate in the Department of Political and International Relations at the University of Oxford. From Tampa, Florida, Mohsen Milani is the Executive Director of the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies at the University of South Florida. From Bethesda, Maryland, Edmund Grahib is a Middle East scholar and analyst, and Einar Tangen is a political and economic affairs commentator based in Beijing. Einar, why don't we start with you? A six nation sweep, a uh, really quick journey. These are all uh, members of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. What are the main takeaways from this uh, journey into the Middle East, would you say? Well, quite frankly, um, the missing piece was Iran. Uh, there had been talks uh, started in 2016 to bring Iran on, on board. It's very important geographically because it, what it does is it provides multiple routes into Europe and uh, connects Turkey, obviously, to Pakistan. So at this point, it's a huge success for the BRI. Uh, you'll note that uh, of the 400 billion, 120 is uh, slated to make sure that there are infrastructure necessary to support that function. Also, uh, China is being uh, very muscular in terms of saying, look, we have a different approach to politics. There will be no regime change. There will be no uh, ideology. We simply want peace and establishing uh, what looks to be a very, very robust uh, multi-layer system for energy going well into the future. And Mosin, let's talk about uh, this uh, large deal that uh, Einer just touched on, uh, the Iran deal, 400 billion over 25 years um, in exchange for oil, and as he mentioned, some of these uh, projects that are gonna be critically important. But uh, talk to us about the importance of this in Tehran, especially given the fact uh, that they were suffering under these U.S. sanctions for quite a while now. Uh, the, the deal between China and Iran, I think, is potentially win-win for both countries. I say potentially, that's the operative word, because, frankly, we do not know a great deal about the details of the agreement. What I can say, what I will say, is that it is extremely important for Iran to have relationship with the second largest economy of the world, China. It is important for China to a lesser degree to have relations with Iran, which is probably among the top 25 largest economies of the world. And moreover, from the Iranian perspective, during the past two years, we have seen a very clear tilt by the Islamic Republic toward the East. I think after the withdrawal of the U.S. from the uh, uh, nuclear deal and after the assassination of Iranian uh, commander, Bassem Soleimani, I think the top leadership in Iran has decided to accelerate the drive toward the East. And this relationship with China is going to consolidate that move toward the East. So from the Iranian perspective, it is a win-win for them. Uh, the reason why I said potentially uh, is great, because we really do not know uh, the details. For example, uh, with what companies, with what individual, with what institutions these deals are made, uh, and uh, are there security deals, are there military uh, cooperation between the two countries. The more we learn about it, of course, we'll be in a better uh, position to judge. But as of now, based on what I know, this is a potentially uh, win-win for Iran and for the People's Republic of China. 
And Mosin, to that point, uh, some analysts say these relationships obviously are different between different countries. Uh, the relationship with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, the, these in many cases are, are much deeper. There are their co-investment strategies. Did these sanctions uh, scare off or perhaps impede the relationship between Iran and China in the last few years? I think they have, and that's one of the uh, big mysteries of this deal. Uh, if the United States decides to impose additional sanction or does not remove the existing uh, sanctions, is China willing to take a chance? After all, the U.S. is China's greatest economic partner. Are they going to take a chance? Uh, I think you're absolutely right. This is why both Iran and China uh, were moving very slowly, but now they have decided it is the right time to finalize this agreement. And Samuel, uh, historically in the past, the Middle East relationship with China pretty much uh, centered on energy, uh, primarily oil. But now we're seeing in recent years, it's kind of morphed into some of these co-investment strategies. Uh, there's the UAE a partnership that came out of this deal, a, a partnership for vaccines. Uh, that's an example of one of the, the, uh, one of the uh, issues that came out of this trip. Talk to us about the importance of this shift. I mean, uh, what are we seeing there? So uh, it's important to keep in mind that historically, China really did not really have a developed strategy in the Middle East. As recently as 2008, only 1% of China's trade was coming through from the West Asia region. And when you look at, uh, it's really under Xi Jinping, and it's really over the past four or five years, as the GCC countries became disenchanted with uh, Obama's policies towards Syria and the U-turns and the commensurate rise of Russia, that these agreements have really taken shape and that they've really crystallized. Now, however, I would say that China has a very hierarchical view of the region. It views some countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Israel at the top of the pecking order. Iran, slightly below that, and others further down on the line with Turkey. So I wouldn't say that you should mention the fact that there's one speed of development or uh, partnerships in the Middle East. There's multiple speeds of development. But overall, the regional partnerships are getting much stronger beyond just transactional oil sales towards uh, anti-piracy drills, counterterrorism drills, and uh, joint investments, as you said. And the BRI, how does that factor in all of this? So obviously, the Belt and Road Initiative is absolutely central to China's approach, and the vast majority of the countries in the MENA region have signed some degree of memorandum with the BRI, including uh, conflict zones such as Libya. So China is hoping that uh, in the post-COVID era, investment doesn't dry up. That was a concern when I was speaking to Chinese academics in the summer, that you know Chinese investment in the BRI will just dry up because of the uh, COVID pandemic. But if that's not the case, they'll continue to invest more there. There's actually more investment and more projects growing at a faster rate in the Middle East than in Africa, where they're starting to stagnate and slow down. So I think that there's a positive outlook for the BRI, which will be augmented further if Caesar Act sanctions on Syria were to be relieved, or if there was some kind of stasis or stability in Libya or Yemen in the near future. And Edmund, uh, I heard one analyst say post-COVID, China is actually becoming the most prominent geoeconomic actor in the Middle East. Uh, the United States still wrapped up with trying to get vaccines out to everybody, trying to deal with the coronavirus. Uh, that's kind of really cleared the way for China to strengthen the investment and trade ties in the region. But unlike the U.S., they're, they're not really there to try and be a security underwriter in the area. So as a result, uh, China can meet with Saudi Arabia one day and Iran the next. Basically, they can have the best of both worlds. Is that how you see it? Yeah, to a large extent, yes. I think the Chinese have pursued a policy where they tried to open up to relations with different countries in the region. They have uh, <clears throat> this relationship actually is old. Of course, that goes back thousands of years. But uh, modern China, and especially the People's Republic of China, has relationship in the 50s and 60s had very good relationship with progressive regimes, anti-colonial regimes, with national liberation movements. They even provided assistance and support. But in the, from the 70s onwards, we began to see a change where relations began to focus on uh, diplomatic ties and trying to build some trade and cultural ties. Uh, then, of course, with the recent times, with the re uh, emergence of China as one of the major, uh, the leading economies in the world, uh, also the, the, uh, the need to expand its uh, uh, relations, uh, basically, in the region they wanted. In, uh, up until around 2000, there was a lot of emphasis on getting uh, energy, because that was very oil and gas. But since then, since 2000, I think, and the new policies pursued by the Chinese government, which we heard about, we began to see emphasis 
uh, on uh, trade, on investments, and that was a, a very new uh, uh, kind of relationship uh, between the countries. And uh, as we uh, see, that relationship was open to countries that were allied or friends or partners of the United States. Gulf countries such as Saudi Arabia, Oman, uh, Qatar, uh, the UAE, uh, Bahrain, and of course even Israel. Israel had a very good relationship uh, with China, economic relationship. There have been trade, and there was recently some pressure on the Israeli government from Washington, actually, uh, to, to, to step back a little bit. But uh, that kind of relationship, and the fact that China did not have a colonial history in the Middle East, also have helped uh, uh, China. And it's, in fact, there was a, uh, a report, and this is very interesting, that, uh, what's known as the Arab Barometer at the University of Michigan did a study where they, uh, um, public opinion in the region, and they found out that uh, out of six countries, Lebanon, uh, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan, um, all these countries said they prefer to have uh, better relations with China than even with the United States. This was done last year. And that is a very uh, significant indication of the way, at least popular, on the popular level, people are looking uh, at, uh, uh, at China and at the United States. The wars, the instability, uh, the interventions in the area have had an impact. Uh, and also, in fact, one of the other things uh, as well uh, is that uh, ch both countries in Iran and uh, China saw in this uh, partnership that really was, there was talk about it, as was mentioned in 2016, uh, this was also a way to respond uh, to what both countries feeling the pressure uh, from Washington, the maximum pressure on Iran, the, the sanctions on Iran and on China, uh, and the fact that the relationship actually between uh, China and uh, the United States and between uh, Iran and the United States have not been very uh, good recently and the last uh, decades, but particularly in recent times. And so it also reflects some of the changes that the world is going through. I mean, uh, uh, the, the political realities are changing. The unipolar world is over. Uh, the post-Cold War uh, world, and there are new relationships, mm. new ambitions, new balances, where there are still information, in a sense. We still don't know how it's going to go. The world is more multipolar than it was, and that's where China yeah. comes in, and they're looking for opportunities uh, for them. And Iran wanted also the opportunity to breathe from, uh, after these harsh right. sanctions, and that's why we saw this uh, movement from the two sides. Right. Well, Einer, uh, as you know, China is a member of the JCPOA. We just showed some images uh, there hit with uh, Wang Yi in, in Iran. Uh, in 2015, China, France, Germany, Russia, the EU, uh, UK, and US, of course, reached a deal with Iran. They wanted to make sure that it was a, a peaceful nuclear program. Of course, US President Donald Trump withdrew from that agreement. Um, can China play a constructive role uh, in trying to get the talks going again when it comes to the JCPOA? Well, it, it, it depends on how you see this. The U.S. is looking at this as uh, this is giving relief to Iran. Iran, uh, Iran is also saying that this uh, presents, uh, gives them better leverage as they're dealing with the U.S. Uh, the real sticking point there on both sides is who will go first. Uh, the U.S. says that they want Iran to stop enriching to 20 percent. Uh, Iran says, look, we're not going to enter a protracted uh, negotiation. You have to go back to the original uh, agreement. And and we will do the same. So right now, it's more of a kind of a playground standoff. I think China, uh, it, as uh, some a group uh, with the others, uh, says that this should just resume and they should put aside a lot of the theatrics and just get on with it. Uh, it's not clear exactly how this is going to be seen in Washington. There's a lot of consternation uh, going on right now because they uh, weren't anticipating that there would be this quick a move by China to, uh, in essence, uh, both diplomatically and economically, uh, you know, do so much in the Middle East in the space of six days.
And Motion, uh, Einer just set the table really well for us. Both sides do uh, seem to think that they have more leverage when we're talking about Iran and the United States. Um, there's domestic politics at stake in both of these countries, uh, which makes it tougher for both sides to come together and actually get talking. You've got an election coming up in June in Iran. There's growing distrust on both sides. Uh, it's a delicate moment, but Iran's foreign minister is indicating the U.S. really needs to take the first step. Here's what he had to say. Uh, let's listen. So we maintain this room. So we don't need to use back channels again. We have a room. We establish the room. We establish its parameters. We establish the tool. The United States simply needs to buy the ticket to come back to the room. That's all. So the U.S. needs to buy the ticket, he says, but, but the time to buy the ticket is narrowing. The campaigning uh, with this election coming up will probably start in May. So we're talking about maybe the month of April. Are you pessimistic? I mean, what needs to happen? Uh, would you please allow me to say one word about uh, an important point about the Iran-China deal uh, that I wasn't able to address? And that is the, the deal that Iran and China uh, made is fundamentally different than the kind of economic deal China has made with the uh, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or with a lot of other Middle Eastern countries. And the difference is that there is a potential for strategic and security cooperation between Iran and China. That kind of cooperation uh, does, not, uh, they, uh, does not exist for uh, Saudi Arabia, who is under the U.S. security umbrella, or for a United Arab Emirates. But Iran is different, and that is why the potential, uh, the potential for this deal to become a major international deal is uh, great. As to uh, your question about the uh, uh, negotiations for the return of the U.S. to JCPOA, uh, frankly, uh, I cannot see how the U.S. would be unwilling to take advantage of the leverage it has. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Biden promised to return to uh, uh, the JCPOA, but the reality is that uh, Iran is under a lot of pressure, uh, under a lot of economic pressure. And uh, power politics is that you play with the cards that are dealt to you. Uh, the United States feels that it has leverage over Iran, and it wants to use that leverage not only, not only, that's the key element, not only to reach uh, a nuclear agreement with Iran, but uh, convince, persuade Tehran that they must also come to the negotiating table to discuss its uh, missile program as well as its regional policies. The U.S. is not going to give up its leverage until and unless it gets some assurance from Iran that they can address all these uh, issues in the near future. Samuel, before this uh, Middle East tour, uh, Wang Yi sat down with his Russian counterpart, uh, Sergei Lavrov, in Nanning. Uh, they discussed a number of issues, and, and they both accused the U.S. of interference in, in other countries' affairs. Uh, they urged the U.S. to rejoin the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, talk to us about the actions of the United States, though, because some of the words that have been floating around uh, towards both Russia and China pretty inflammatory. Is that going to create uh, these two countries coming together, forging a relationship? And if so, what kind of weight does it have moving forward? So one of the interesting paradoxes of the Russia-China relationship is that they have been developing a strategic partnership that's got obviously a strong economic foundation, energy, normative alignments in the United Nations. But that relationship has not really translated into working groups, uh, tangible cooperation on extra-regional security crises the regional, regional security crises in the Middle East. Like you don't really have much in the way of China and Russia engaging independently away from a UN framework on issues like Syria or Yemen or Iran. So the question is, if the U.S. Uh, rhetoric or the U.S. Uh, deterioration of relations with Russia and China continues, will that kind of cooperation take place? Because that could have a profound impact on what we see going forward in the Middle East. Right now, I think, though, when Wang Yi met with Lavrov, there were a few issues that were probably considered. I mean, first of all, there was a discussion of an alternative to SWIFT, which would be a way to uh, ease the sanctions uh, pain on Iran and to create a loophole. And it's also a show of frustrations with the Europeans that were insects before that. So that's kind of one dimension of it. The second thing, of course, would be to kind of create a bonding over non-interference, which would deal with issues like Xinjiang, Navalny, or in the case of Saudi Arabia, Khashoggi. So talking about that. 
And also, uh, Sergey Lavrov, I just made a visit to the Middle East and to some of the same Gulf countries that uh, Wang Yi visited, so Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So it's highly likely that they were probably exchanging about regional strategy, too. Interesting. Uh, Einer, I mentioned it before, but I'd like to go back to this joint venture that uh, China entered into with the UAE to, to come up with a vaccine, Sinopharm uh, there. Um, it's important. The deal's important on several levels. One, of course, is that it's going to help diversify UAE's economy. But, but it's important also because during this pandemic, we've seen kind of a, a richer bond between China and these Middle Eastern countries. Uh, there's been the, the uh, providing of masks ventilators, uh, medical expertise, where they've actually made some of the health officials from China available to Middle Eastern doctors to kind of talk about strategies and that sort of thing. In fact, it uh, even led Iran's foreign minister, Zarif, to say uh, that China is a friend for hard times. So add it all up uh, during this pandemic. What does this mean in terms of a strategy and, and cementing these bonds? Well, I, I think it's less about uh, diplomacy than it is simply about a different kind of attitude. Uh, China has put out uh, 38 million uh, doses of um, a vaccine to 17 Middle East countries. And the idea was is simply uh, to show the world how a power should act. Uh, this is a very noticeable departure from what the U.S. has done and even Europe, uh, where most of it has been kind of hoarded for domestic consumption. But I, I think when you're going back to UAE, it's not just that they're doing this uh, COVID-19 um, uh, vaccine. It's also a few weeks ago, they entered into a, um, a system which will allow, in essence, the uh, new digital yuan to be uh, placed and traded in UAE. Uh, this was part of a consortium of UAE, Thailand, and Hong Kong. Uh, this is uh, one of the alternate settlement systems to SWIFT itself. Uh, China has also entered into a partnership with SWIFT. This signals that China has, um, you know, a very uh, you know, forward-looking idea about the role of the digital yuan, which makes this whole BRI make a lot more sense. Uh, once you have all these connections, you need to have a currency that can work for all uh, individuals involved excuse me, involved. And with the U.S. adding on a lot of debt, uh, questions about inflation, uh, there's going to be uh, concerns, as you've already seen in the uh, international markets as money pours into China, about the stability of the U.S. dollar. Interesting. Uh, Mosin, let's talk about Iran, because it's still struggling with the virus. It's really the epicenter of uh, the coronavirus in the Middle East. Uh, Two million cases so far, it's more than 62,000 deaths. Um, China has provided about 250,000 doses of the vaccine so far. They're pledging even more. Uh, give us a sense of how things look on the ground in Iran, and talk to us, if you will, about some of these goodwill gestures on the part of China. Well, uh, for a country of uh, 83, 84 million uh, with one of the highest rates of death from COVID. Uh, Iran started a little bit too late. Uh, they were slow reacting to this virus, as was uh, a number of other countries. And they still haven't been able to uh, fully recover, although the death rate, daily death rate, is now below 90 per night per, per, per day, which is uh, pretty good when you compare it to what it was four or five years ago, I mean, four or five months ago. Um, Iran still needs a lot of vaccines, but as you know, Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, has forbidden uh, uh, in importing American vaccines. And I'm not very sure if American companies were willing to provide Iran with a large number of vaccines, but I understand that uh, China has done that. Uh, which is uh, welcomed in Iran. And of course, the, uh, the Russians have also provided a good number of vaccines, and Iran needs much more. However, uh, Iran claims uh, that they can produce uh, domestically, can produce vaccine by the beginning, by beginning of summer, another two to three months. If they actually succeed in doing this, that would be a, a really major achievement, and then they can deal with this deadly virus in a much more effective uh, and more humane way. Edmund, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Western analysts, Western journalists, because when they look at a trip like Wang Yi's, they tend to focus on, you know, what does this mean for the United States? Will it be supplanted in the region? Uh, is this an area of concern? Uh, how will the Biden administration look at it? So, so answer that question for us. 
Uh, first of all, let me just say that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the UAE and the vaccines, apparently there were there was cooperation between China, uh, the Chinese and uh, UAE doctors. They work, worked together to test uh, the vaccines. And in fact, the first vaccine that was used in the UAE was the Chinese uh, vaccine. As to the uh, U.S. Uh, response, clearly this is uh, something that has been seen as uh, threatening to undermine, potentially could undermine uh, to a certain extent the uh, U.S. ability to put pressure, maximum pressure on Iran. Uh, uh, primarily because uh, this would also would uh, strengthen China's ties with, uh, with Iran and with some of the other uh, countries in the region. And it's likely to broaden uh, the interest of some of the regional countries to move towards what's seen as uh, the Eurasian uh, 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 alliance, uh, the Shanghai Agreement, but primarily between Russia and China and some other countries. Iran has been an observer with that, uh, uh, with that, uh, 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 and that agreement, uh, and that, uh, and they want to to be uh, full members, and so that shows like Iran is posi positioning itself to move towards Eurasia. This is considered uh, will be considered by the United States and some of its allies as a threat uh, to to their interests in the region. Also, the, one of the other things is that, as we know now, the United States uh, sees uh, is trying to build alliances is with other Asian countries as well. With, we have, you know, uh, for example, the um, attempts to strengthen ties with Australia, Japan, India, uh, South Korea. Uh, basically, it's, this is seen by China as to, uh, it's aimed at confronting China. So basically, the U.S. is very much concerned about the uh, strategic uh, interest in that region. And that's why we've begun to see the shift in fact, from the Middle East toward Asia, because the, the perception that the main threats, as uh, Secretary Blinken and before him, actually, even under the Trump administration, China was seen as the main challenge, the main uh, competitor to the United States. And that's why we saw these increasing efforts to try to, uh, on the one hand, to extract the United States slowly, although I don't know how easy it's going to be from the Middle East, and to move towards uh, uh, the uh, Pacific uh, Indian Ocean uh, regions. And this is a, a huge area. And in fact, this is why uh, we are seeing a great deal of tension in that area, whether it's the question of Taiwan, whether it's the question of the Uyghurs uh, in China, whether it's like what's happening in, uh, uh, with Hong Kong, also the conflict between China and some of its neighbors over its borders. All of these are important points of view. Now we see also the return to the Korean ten tensions yeah. are beginning to mount over Korea, and the U.S. would like to see China play an important role, although with the, also the growing tensions in that area, we wonder, one wonders how that is likely right. uh, to play. All right. Well, uh, we've run out of time. It's been a great discussion. I want to thank all of our uh, guests for joining us. Uh, that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter, Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.